So in our previous video, we talked about a very common infection, pneumonia. Let's talk about another common infection. How about the common cold? The common cold falls under the category of rhinitis, which is an inflammation of your nasal mucosa. In the common cold, don't you have that stuffy nose, nasal congestion, runny nose, all that stuff? So it's an inflammation of your nasal mucosa. And often due to an infection, often of a viral nature. So you're thinking of your rhinoviruses, your adenoviruses, and because it's a viral infection, you don't give antibiotics. It usually clears within a few days, okay? And that's your common cold, that's infectious rhinitis. You can have other types of rhinitis. You can have allergic rhinitis, allergic rhinitis, and that's a fancy way of saying allergies. So um, unless you're a really bad history taker, it should be clear the person has allergic rhinitis, uh, uh, allergies. You know, every season they get runny nose, itchy eyes, all that stuff, all those allergy symptoms. All those allergy symptoms. And this is an atopic disease. So it's also associated with other atopic diseases like um, asthma, food allergies, all that stuff. Okay. Something you should know, this constant inflammation can cause an overgrowth of the nasal mucosa, fleshy overgrowths. Fancy way of saying that is polyps. You know, I'm gonna ask you, we talked about a few other conditions that cause polyps. Can you recall what those were? Pause the video and try and recall what they were. There are two of them, okay? Give you a second, give you a second. One of them was in an adult. You had that adult asthma that was aspirin-induced. Aspirin-induced asthma. And then the other one was in a CF patient, all right? So a kid with CF, you look up their nose, they have a nasal polyp, there it is. So we can add one more to the list and that would be allergic rhinitis. I promise we won't add any more, okay? These are the only three you really need to know. But any type of chronic inflammation can cause this and that's why you get polyps from all these disorders. They all cause kind of chronic inflammation, okay? This is rhinitis. Now, how do we treat it? We can treat allergic rhinitis because it is an atopic disease. That's the whole IgE causing uh, mast cells to degranulate, release their histamine, all that stuff. So uh, one, one thing, one drug we can use to treat allergic rhinitis is gonna be histamine blockers, H1 receptor blockers. If we can block that histamine from binding to its receptor and causing all these, these symptoms, then we can kind of reduce reduce all that terrible symptoms of allergic rhinitis. So H1 receptor blockers. Now the first generation that came out, first generation, wasn't too specific for H1. So it started blocking other things like your muscarinic receptors, like your adrenergic receptors. So side effects included things like anti-muscarinic, that's your dry mouth, all that good stuff, um, anti-adrenergic causing hypotension, all that good stuff. And it can also cross into your, to your central nervous system. Block histamine there. And when you block histamine there, you get things like sedation. Right? So Benadryl actually was our first gen. So Benadryl kind of caused sedation. But we got a little bit better. And then when we pumped out our second gen histamine H1 receptor blockers, they, these were more specific. So you get less sedation because they were more specific. These are those specific allergy drugs you can find at like Walgreens or whatever. Um, those are your Zyrtex and whatever. So second gen, a little bit more specific. That's allergic rhinitis. How about um, infectious rhinitis? Well, infectious rhinitis, like we said, is from a virus. You don't give antibiotics. So we can, if it's severe enough, we can kind of treat it symptomatically. You can go to your local friendly drugstore, get some stuff to kind of reduce your phlegm and your cough and kind of reduce your stuffy nose. So treat it that kind of symptomatically, but don't give antibiotics. So some symptomatic relief. You can reduce the mucus by a group of drugs called expectorants. And these just kind of loosen the mucus. All right, loosen mucus, okay. One of them is called guaifenesin. It's seen in things like Robitussin, things like Mucinex, Mucinex. Those are probably more recognizable and they just thin your secretions, thin your mucus, make it less stuffy. Another one is N-acetylcysteine or NAC. And you're probably thinking, wait, NAC, isn't that the thing you use to treat acetaminophen overdoses? And you're absolutely right. In the liver, it treats acetaminophen overdoses. Um, in your respiratory tract, however, it 
thins your mucus. It kind of molecularly breaks down your mucus, makes it a little bit thinner. So it breaks down your disulfide bonds in your mucus. Kind of chopped it up. Disulfide bonds in mucus. And thins it out that way. Thins it out that way. So that's something you can do to reduce the mucus. You can have another group of drugs to kind of reduce the stuffy nose. Nasal decongestants. Nasal decongestion. Stop the congestion of your nose. One of them is pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine is, it works on your sympathetic system as an alpha agonist. Sorry, sympathetic. Sympathetic. Okay. And by working on your alpha agonist, it can cause vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction reduces blood flow, reduces that edema, reduces that congestion. Vasoconstriction. Some side effects. You can vasoconstrict too much, you can get hypertension. Hypertension. And also because it works on your sympathetic system, it's a, it's a CNS stimulant. It's a stimulant. And it can be used illicitly to make methamphetamine. Meth. Okay, so just be careful of that. Speaking of drugs that can be used illicitly, let's talk about our next group, antitussives. These are things that stop you from coughing. All right, so if you have a really bad cold and you're coughing all the time, you don't want that, you can get antitussives. A big one is dextromethorphan. All right, this is seen in your cough syrups. And they have a mild opiate effect. Okay. So illicitly they a lot of people like to mix it with like Sprite and make it make a drink out of it. And if you overdose, you you treat it as any other opiate overdose. So you give them naloxone, which is a opiate antagonist. Naloxone for overdose. Okay. But we're not talking about illicit drug use here. We're talking about respiratory drugs. So let's just see how it works. How does this drug work as a respiratory drug? How does it work as an antitussive? How does it block you from coughing? It blocks your excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. All right. This excitatory neurotransmitter binds onto its receptor, the NMDA receptor, and does this excited, excitatory whatever, okay? So if we wanna stop this, then we block it. So this drug is a NMDA receptor antagonist. You block that receptor, you block its excitatory effects, you block the cough, okay? NMDA receptor antagonist. That's how you treat rhinitis, both infectious and allergic. Since we're in this kind of head, neck, upper respiratory tract region, let's talk about other pathologies that affect this region. You can have sinusitis. Sinusitis. Judging by the name, there's inflammation of your sinuses, often your maxillary sinuses, okay? So history of physical exam will be pretty evident, and when you press down on the sinuses, it will hurt. They'll have some discharge. All right, maxillary sinus, most common, most common. Like rhinitis is often viral in nature. Vi <laughs> viral in nature. So do you give antibiotics? No, it wouldn't do anything. Uh, often clears on its own. There's something you should know, however, let's say a person has sinusitis, they're doing better, they're doing better, you're thinking, oh, they're gonna clear on their own. And then all of a sudden they take a dive. Suddenly they get worse, suddenly it's more painful, suddenly they're having more discharge. This is called double sickness. Double sickness. What the heck happened? They were doing so well. Well, they're starting to clear this viral infection and then all of a sudden, bacteria entered the picture. Now they have a viral and a bacterial infection. And that's what's causing them to deteriorate. That's what's causing them to have more pain. That's what's causing them to have more discharge. Bacteria have now entered the game. Okay. Common bacteria include strep pneumo and H flu. They like to ask this. They'll talk about someone with sinusitis and then suddenly they take a dive. You're thinking of double sickness. Bacteria have entered the game. That is it for these common 
um, infections of your upper respiratory tract. There's a few more upper respiratory pathologies in my notes, so make sure you check that out. Our last topic of today is going to be on neoplasms of your upper respiratory tract. Neoplasms. There's a common benign one called angiofibroma. Judging by the name, it has fibrous tissue and blood vessels. Angio means related to blood vessels. So this is going to be a very vascular tumor. And because it's vascular, you can cause bleeding, epistaxis. Epistaxis. That's all I really want to talk about for angiofibromas. Uh, I want to do a little side note on, on nosebleeds, epistaxis. Nosebleeds, incredibly common. I'd be surprised if you never had a nosebleed. You just kind of rest, put some ice on your nose, they'll, they'll go away. Most common cause of nosebleed is by messing with your, your blood vessels in your nose, aka digging your nose. So don't dig your nose, people. Often in the anterior portion of your nose, anterior portion. All right, so the, the front of your nose. When you're digging, you kind of scrape the front of your nose. And especially these blood vessels called your Kieselbach, Kieselbach plexus. Okay. Rarely you can dig into the posterior portion of your nose, the back of your nose, posterior. And this affects the vessel called your sphenoid. Palatine artery, and that makes sense. That makes sense. Your uh, sphenoid sinuses and your sphenoid bone is a little bit further back on your posterior side, and your palate is a little bit further back on your posterior side. So these are all vessels that are a little bit further back on your on your back wall of your nose. This is a lot more rare and a lot more dangerous because because it's a little bit further back, it can kind of go down your your esophagus, your throat, your mouth. Yeah, you can aspirate, you can choke on your own blood, so all right, more dangerous, more dangerous. But let's jump back into our talk on neoplasms. Let's not get distracted on epistaxis. Let's jump back on our talk on neoplasms. We talked about a benign neoplasm. Let's talk about some malignant ones. Malignant. Cancers of your head and neck differ depending on its carcinogen. Common one is HPV. HPV may be transmitted through oral sex and because it's transmitted through oral sex it often affects affects your oral cavity and your pharynx so your oral pharynx now is that any strand of hpv usually the higher risk strands of hpv what are the high risk strands can you list at least three of them at least three of them all right hopefully you said things like hpv 16 18 16 they really like to really like to touch on ebv can also cause cancer here, Epstein-Barr virus. And instead of the oral cavity, it usually affects upper, more closer to your nose, so your nasal pharynx, nasal pharynx. And it's seen more in the Chinese population, Chinese population. And then last but not least, probably the most common of all is things like alcohol and smoking. These are just carcinogens. And when you ingest them, they the first thing they touch is your, your mouth, right? So they can cause, uh, Squamous cell carcinoma, as that's the lining of your, of your oral pharynx and your, your mouth. Um, cause it anywhere along that, along that track. And one thing you should know is that field effect is common. What is the field effect? Field effect is when you bask an area, kind of marinate an area with carcinogens. Because that whole area is covered with carcinogens, then you can have different tumors pop up kind of independently of each other. Yeah, that's the field effect. That is pathology of your upper respiratory tract. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.